Okay, so this is the second hour of Physics 1C for May 26th. Um, what I want to do now is, is kind of step away from all this mathematics and kind of talk to you guys about um, some history of light, basically, and how it was understood. So what is light? Well, light is this phenomenon that, uh, you know, you, you look around you and everything you see emits some type of light. Uh, when the sun's out, you can see things really well because the sunlight reflects off of surfaces and allows, like the surface of a pond, for example, and it allows you to, to, to see the pond or it reflects off the concrete and you can see the concrete. It lights things up, right? Uh, the sun does. Now, what that thing is, what light is and how we can understand it, well, people started to learn that you can manipulate light. Maybe you guys can tell me, what are some of the ways that you can manipulate a beam of light? A mirror, right? A mirror causes light to reflect. How else can you do it? That actually tells you something about what light does, right? It has a property, some, some of the properties of it that we're going to talk about here. One of the properties is that a mirror can reflect it, right? What that looks like is basically... Um, the eraser doesn't work on that thing. Um, the, the reflection process is basically like, suppose that I've got a surface right here that's a mirror, right? And then suppose that I shine a beam of light over here. So let's say I've got like a flashlight right here. And I've got like a mag light or something. And I shine a beam of light out of here. And the beam has a ray that kind of comes this way. And then suppose that I've got like a screen right here. Oh, this is kind of too far away. Suppose I have a screen that's like right here. Then what will happen is that that light beam is going to bounce off. And instead of seeing the light in the mirror, what you'll see is that there's going to be a bright spot on the, on the wall over here, right? Um, color. Yep, that's one of the other things. That's a good one too. Uh, another property is that there's different colors. There's different colors. You said that a prism is one of them. Yep. A prism is a phenomenon where we know that basically if I take a beam of white light, right, and I send it into a prism, oops, we can use yellow for white, right? I don't know. And I send it into a prism, so let's put a little prism right here. That when the light comes into the prism, what happens is that, uh, if you want to do a small eraser, um, it goes through and it basically ends up getting broken up into all the colors of the rainbow. So the light beam basically kind of spreads out in a way, you might say. And when it comes out on the other side, all the different colors come out. So you have a range of colors where, and let's see, which one gets bent the most? I can't remember. It's like, is it red that gets bent the most? So the red, so blue is the one that gets bent the least, right? So it's like, the blue would come out this way. Um, I don't have a red, so we'll put a red in here. And then you'd have the red coming out the other side on the far end. And in between, you'd have all the colors of the rainbow. So red and then orange a little above that, right? Oh, no, this is not going to look good. Basically, you can split up a beam of light into the entire spectrum, red, orange, yellow. So next would be yellow. So you'd have a yellow in here, red, orange, yellow, green. You have a green beam coming out like this. That's not green. This one's green. You have a green thing like this. And then what's left? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue. So there's the blue. That's pretty much it, basically, right? So you have white light over here. You pass it through a, basically a piece of glass or plastic or something like that. And it splits up into all of these different wavelengths right here, like a rainbow. It's quite literally the exact same thing happens when you look at a rainbow. Where with the rainbow, what's happening is instead of a prism, you have little water droplets spread throughout the sky that, that create the same prism effect. So there's different colors. And one of the things is that the white light is basic, basically composed of these colors, right? White light is made up of all of these different colors. It's a combination of all of them. What other properties does light have that you know about? I've got some questions here. I wonder if these are anybody from the class. Yeah, it's a bunch of people that can't register 1B, basically. Yeah, that's too bad that's happening to so many people. 
uh, it's Ethan, right? Ethan, you're taking you're taking one D right now, right? So you guys have actually been studying light, so you probably know a lot of the properties, right? Or you took it. Okay, cool. cool. What are some of the other properties about light that we know about? How about lenses? What do we know about light and how it can be affected by lenses? Refraction is another property. Okay. And what is refraction? So the way refraction works is that the simplest example of this that people often use is suppose that I have a uh, container, like a cup. And within this container, I have um, water. So this whole thing is like filled with, whoops, this whole thing is filled with water in here. So we've got water all throughout here. And what happens is that if you put like a pencil or something into this system right here, the pencil will literally like kind of look kind of straight up here. Obviously, it's a pencil after all. There's your eraser at the top and stuff. Um, but then when it gets into the water, the pencil is literally going to look bent. You should be able to notice this with a straw as well, that if you have a clear glass and so this, this thing would be a straight pencil, except that when you put it in the water, there's this like thing where the pencil actually looks kind of bent once you put it in the water. Have you guys all, have you guys ever seen that before? In the pool, yeah. Yeah, if you look, if you're standing in a pool and you like look down, you know, you get this different kind of impression of, uh, yeah, people look distorted in the pool, exactly. That phenomenon is called refraction. So light can reflect, there's different colors, it can refract. Refract basically just means that light is bent by different mediums in different amounts. Okay, to draw it in the way I drew it on the mirror here, suppose that I have a surface like this. So I've got my surface right here. And suppose that it's water, like a pool or something like that, right? And the top is the surface. Okay, so that's water or something like that. When light comes in, when it enters the water, oh, let me draw a little bit differently. If the light comes in at an angle like this, then what happens is that the light ray, as it comes in, it gets bent towards the normal, basically. Right? That's the bending that occurs. And if this is the bottom of the surface here, actually, if this is, if, so if this was like air and this is water, or it could be, it could be plastic or something like that too, then it bends, but then when it comes out the other side, it bends back out this way. So that's how the light ray works, right? Uh, light, ug light, optics, ug. You don't like optics? Optics is really interesting. Optics is really interesting. All right. The refraction index, those are, that's one of the properties that describes how this happens. And we might actually get to the point where we talk about refraction index today. We'll see. So these are some of the properties of light. Are there any other properties you guys can think of? Some of you guys, what else did you guys mention? Okay, Leah mentioned that all light travels at the same speed. That's another thing we know. It appears to be the case that within a given medium, um, that light appears to be constant, the speed of light. So the speed, first of all, the speed is not infinitely fast. It has, it has a fixed speed. Uh, is constant in a given medium. I'm going to add that. You have to say this part too because the speed of light is less in water than it is in air. The speed of light is faster in plastic than it is in water, etc., etc. Lasers can burn things. You get constant in a given medium. And a medium is basically just the environment in which the light ray is propagating. Okay. Lasers can burn things. That's right. Lasers can burn things. What about magnifying glasses? Nobody mentioned anything about magnifying glasses yet. What can a magnifying glass do? It's related to this thing, actually. The fact that you can bend light with, with different mediums means if you take certain types of lenses, like a magnifying glass, where it's kind of bulged in the middle and stuff like that, you can take a light beam, right, that comes in like this, and it can basically be focused down into a solid beam like this. And if you, if you put something at what's called the focal point right here, you can burn it, right? Yeah, this is what, that's how glasses work, basically, right? You can enlarge and also flip the image. That's right. That's one of the things that you use to project images on a screen, right? In a, uh, it can converge or diverge depending on what type of lenses you have. Um, the, it's, you know, 
you said they can enlarge and flip the image. That's that's how a projector works, right? A projector has basically a lens, and the lens has the effect of blowing up the image that you're that you're looking at. So you can take a small slide or a small image, like on a piece of film, and you can project it onto you know a forty foot screen in a movie theater or something like that, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It can be absorbed. That's true. It can it can it can be reflected and it can be absorbed. That's true. Light is a small part of the wave spectrum. That's true. That's true. There are other things. Basically, these properties I'm describing describe uh, all types of light, including uh, the other things too. Glasses can burn people. Yes. <laughs> okay, so these are some properties of light, right? And now suppose that you want to describe what light is and how these properties work, right? What do we do in physics? We come up with some kind of a model to describe what's happening here, right? And there's different models that you can come up with, right? So one of the models, um, if the question is what is light, how does it work, etc. Then um, the first model we could talk about actually comes from Newton, okay? So Newton's idea, and he did a lot of work in optics. He played with uh, prisms and, and was trying to understand it. He saw this picture here with this with the um, with the spectrum of, of light, right? And he said, "Well, white light seems to be composed of all of these different types of light over here." So he said, "Well, maybe there's red light, and there's orange light, and there's green light, and there's blue light." And every one of those individual types of light, we could say is kind of like a particle of light in the same way that uh, certainly around this time, yeah, maybe a little bit after, yeah, a little bit after, people were starting to understand that everything was composed of atoms. He thought, well, maybe light is a particle. Um, and it's basically made up of you know, you've got your red particles, you've got your blue particles, you've got, you call them corpuscles, use the word corpuscle, which I think just means a small body or something like that. That's, that's the word he uses, corpuscle. Light is a particle. There's red, blue, you know, green, purple, magenta particles. And somehow when you take all of these different types of particles, you get white light. That's what he said. Light's a particle. It's red, blue, and green particles. So that theory works really well to describe reflection, right? How do you describe reflection with a, with a hard object? Well, you say, I take a ball, I bounce it off the surface of the ground, it reflects off just like light was, right? I could say, suppose there's a little ball right here and I shoot it in this direction, the laws of physics tell me that it's gonna bounce off the mirror and be bounced off in the other direction, right? And that was Newton's theory of light. Light's a particle. It's made up of red, green, and green particles. This seems to explain the spectrum phenomenon. It seems to explain the reflection phenomenon. And I'm pretty sure he could explain the refraction phenomenon, but that's something that escapes me. I can't remember how he did it. I, I do remember reading Newton's theories of light, and maybe some of you guys can look this up for me and tell me how he explained refraction. I don't remember what he said. It reflects at the same angle. That's an important part of this, right? I, I didn't mention this, but one of the features of light is that if I draw a, um, a normal vector for my, my mirror surface right here, Basically, these two angles are the same. The, what we call the incident angle and the reflected angle are the same. And that's something that would occur with a balancing ball as long as the surface was perfectly smooth and as long as um, the surface had a perfect rebound, meaning a coefficient of restitution equal to 1, i.e. perfect exchange of energy between the surface and the, and the ball. Right? But he thought light was kind of perfect in that sense. All right, so I have to go read about this. I can't remember how he, how he explained refraction, right? I don't remember how he explained that or why it is that light would slow down in water, etc. But I, as long as you know one of these two things, like if you can prove this part, you can prove this part. Like knowing that the speed of light is constant in a given medium, but that the velocity of light in air is greater than the velocity of light in water allows you to prove refraction. So I'm pretty sure you can, you can get there by just making that assumption. So that's one idea of what light is, okay? Now, there were a whole lot of other people that worked on this idea as well. 
And what I studied, and I'm sure there were other philosophers that did this, doesn't have to do with the structure of the air compared to water. It does. Yes. Yes. It is about the structure of the air compared to water. Water is denser. Yep. And there's basically energy exchange that occurs when a light beam comes in and it hits the water. Um, there's an energy exchange that occurs here. And as it turns out, the, the wavelength actually changes when you go from one to the other. I'm saying more than I need to right now. But it does have to do with the structure of air. Air is like more diffuse than water. Yep. So light is a particle, red, blue, and green particles. We will, we're getting there, Ethan. That's exactly right. That's a big part of this. So there was another guy who was a Dutch scientist. And I don't know if you guys have heard of this guy before because I don't remember reading about him until I went to college. His name was, I think it was Christian Huygens. Huygens? I don't know how to pronounce this. I'm not going to pretend. We just always said Huygens. And Huygens had the theory that basically, well, you know what? It might be a particle. Newton might be right. But let's, let's open our minds here. Uh, and let's say that what if light was described as a wave instead? What if he said that light is a wave? And that the reason why you get red, blue, and green colors is because the wave has different wavelengths. Right? Different wavelengths. Meaning that for the for the red wave, well here let's let's actually use red for this. So like if I have if I have a red wave of light, let's see if I can remember this properly, red has a long wavelength. So that might be red. And I might say, well, this is the wavelength right here. We use the symbol lambda for that. And that a blue light is simply just got a, a kind of a higher frequency and a shorter wavelength, right? So this might be blue light. And blue light may be able to fit like multiple wavelengths in. I'm exaggerating heavily here. But this might be red and this might be blue. Okay, and now the wavelength is this distance here, right? The length of, you know, one cycle, basically. He said, the reason why one is red and one is blue is you're just seeing different wavelengths. You're seeing different frequencies, right? And why would he say that? Well, we have an experience of something that's exactly like this, which is sound, right? We can, with our, with our own lungs or with a, an instrument, such as a piano or a saxophone or something like that, we can produce different pitches, right? We can have a high pitch, or you can have like a really deep low pitch, right? And that idea of different kind of frequencies, high pitch frequency versus low pitch frequency, we can that, well, certainly we can apply the same thing to light. And maybe these different wavelengths are just, it's just, it's just different pitches of the light, so to speak. It's like a, it's like a high pitch blue light or it's a, it's a low pitch red light. And instead of pitch, we just see color. It's just different versions of the same thing, right? Light's a wave. And then he says, well, this theory wouldn't be any good of light being a wave if I couldn't also explain all of these other ideas here, right? He should be able to explain how reflection works, and he should be able to just explain how refraction works, right? And he's able to do that, basically. Huygens was able to prove, just as Newton was, that by assuming the light was a wave, you can also prove all the exact same stuff. And that's a very fascinating thing to be able to do, to say that there's two different ways of describing what light is, and both of them are able to describe the phenomenon perfectly, right? And that's really powerful. And maybe it tells you something deep, deep about what, what's going on with light, right? So this is all really good. Two different theories. I think Huygens was more well adopted because there was less proof of what Newton was describing in some sense. Like, he couldn't actually find the particles. You know, you can't observe the individual particles of light, or at least they couldn't at the time. And then in 1820, something different happened. That, that basically, there's a new phenomenon that they found. So in 1820, a couple of guys named Young. Oh man, I'm probably getting this right, because I'm just doing this off the top of my head. I think it's Young and Fresnel. I think that's how you pronounce it. They do an experiment. Okay. And the experiment that they perform is called the double slit experiment. As Ethan mentioned already. And I feel like to some extent, instead of me drawing some just really crappy picture, I think what I want to do here is I want to go to the internet and I want to find um, 
I'm going to go to fat, and I'm going to show you guys how the double set experiment works. And I'm going to do it in a way that is a little more accessible than me just drawing things on the, on the board. So we go to physics, and we go to light and radiation. Let me go to this. Hopefully I can actually do this one. Oh no, it didn't quite work. We'll just go through this one at a time. Okay, so what's a wave? Think about a drop of water going into a pond. You've seen this before. You've seen how whenever you drop it, and let's do this part first. When I have a little droplet that goes into the water, it creates a wave. And the wave is basically just a water wave, right? Um, so if I drop one little thing in there, you see that the, the basically you have these little ripples that go out, right? Simulation is very familiar, yeah. Okay, so you've seen this before. And if I have a continual wave, well, that's just like drops, it's just continually drop. And then you get waves, right? The distance between, you know, the, the peak of one to the peak of the other one, or the trough of one to the trough of the other one, is a wavelength, right? So the wavelength's like from there to there. From there to there, that's a wavelength, right? Now, if I change the frequency and make it faster, those waves start to get closer together, right? And what is the sound? How does this one work? Okay, so this is a sound wave created by uh, a diaphragm that's kind of like moving like that, and then I guess this is going to be a light wave. And in this case, if I change the frequency to red, the waves are more spread out. And if I change the, the frequency to blue, they're kind of tighter together, right? And like, you can see that there's like, it's like 15 to 20 here. Whereas when we go to red, much more spread out. Right. Okay. So now let's see what happens if I have two, um, two sources right here, right? So I've got one here and I've got one here. And now they're both dropping little droplets. Now you get kind of a different thing. Because what happens is you have two waves that are coming out, and I kind of want to make the frequency higher so you can see what's going on here. You start to get these interesting patterns that occur. This is something you could do in a bathtub or something like that. But you might notice that there's these, these kind of like patterns that are showing up here. One, one in particular is this line right here um, that's kind of forming, kind of at the edge of the wave fronts. What's happening here is that if I have two waves and the two waves basically are, are out of sync with each other, you're going to get a black spot. And if the two waves add together, you're going to get a bright spot. Right? And if I change the separation of these things, like if I put them closer or farther apart, it's also going to change the way the pattern looks. It's effectively the same thing. The spread is larger now. Right than it was when they were farther apart. Let's wait till they interfere with each other. Look at that. This one, because they're so far apart from each other, there's actual multiple lines that are showing up here. Multiple lines. Okay. So now let's see what happens if I put slits in here. So here's my water wave generator. This is literally going to be something that just sends waves up and down and up and down. This is like the, if you've ever been in a wave pool or something like that, this is what happens. And notice that when that light hits the slits, okay, and what is this thing? This is basically a screen that doesn't allow light to pass through. Okay, the light basically can only pass through the holes. Let's make them closer together here. And let's make this just a little mm, like that. I think that's what I want to do. And now we have to change frequency. I want the frequency to be really high. And then what do I want to do? I actually want to make this bigger, maybe? So notice what's happening here. I think this is what I want. I have waves that come in that are straight. But then when they hit the, the surface right here, they basically each of these points ends up acting like a source, right? Notice on the right-hand side of this slit right here, and I'll move this back a little bit. 
on the right hand side of the slit what i have is what looks very similar to what we saw a second ago of two different waves that are interfering with each other right notice what's going on here and then if we click back to here it's basically the same thing with these these little droplets being replaced by the slits right but the pattern on the right side is pretty similar to this pattern over here right just a little bit lower in intensity because a lot of this energy is being absorbed by the screen and we can do it with light as well. We can do two slits. Let's put a screen on here. And now let's really see kind of what's happening here. I'll move this back again. Turn the light on. Oh, that's way easier to see. Now watch what happens on the screen over here. You get a pattern. And those places where we have lines, and kind of in between the, with the waves, the place where there's cancellation occurring, comes up as a dark spot on your screen. Okay, dark spot right here. And this pattern on the right hand side is often referred to as like a double slit interference pattern. The light interferes with itself and it produces this pattern like this. Now what this actually looks like, okay? Let's see if we can find you guys a good picture of this while this is running. What this actually ends up looking like is of this. Those of you guys that have taken 1C have already seen this, but here's a few examples of what this actually looks like. So suppose that instead of having a light generator right here, I put a laser at this location, right? And then I shine that laser through some, some slits. The type of thing that I'm going to see on a wall, and I think that if you've taken 1D, you've already seen this picture right here. You see these little pictures like this. Bright spot in the middle, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright. And compare that to this right here. Bright in the middle, dark, not quite as bright as the center one. But uh, yeah, bright, dark, bright. So we call this a double slit interference pattern. And some examples of what they look like. Uh, here's one. Looks kind of like that. Or it looks like this. Or it looks like this, if it's a kind of more broad spread beam. Um, here's a really good one. This is a perfect picture because this is showing you that literally it's a laser light that's fed through a slit. Now the slit here actually has to be extremely skinny, right? Those of you guys that have taken 1D, do, do you guys remember how, 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 how tiny these slits are right here? How small do they need to be? Do you guys remember? Small relative to what, basically? Do you guys remember? It's okay if you don't remember. To the wavelength, exactly. And the wavelength of light we're gonna learn is like something like 400 nanometers or something like that. So these slits need to be really skinny. They need to be like micrometer scale slits. Um, but yeah, when you pass the what, what was originally just a straight laser beam through these slits, the beam basically kind of spreads out in a way. So yeah, it's really neat, honestly. I, I don't know if you guys thought like this was interesting when you when you did it, but I remember seeing this for the first time and being utterly amazed at the amount of order that you get. I mean, it's just so perfectly ordered, these little beautiful little dots. And this one, what you see in this one right here, this is a video. Let's see here. Yep, so it's just a video that shows you this image a bunch, I guess, but. Um, He's, oh, he's going through the different... God, I wish we could be at school. I could show you guys this stuff. <laughs> yes, diffraction is the reason why we have larger and larger telescopes, because there's a physical limit in the resolution at distant object. That's right. And it's a function of the diameter of the telescope, right? Physical optics is scary, but cool. Yes. Sure is. So, this phenomenon here is one of the most important phenomenons in the history of science. It's extremely important. And you'll learn more and more about this. But... The reason why it's important, okay, is because this phenomenon, let's take it back where we came from, right? We said this is a wave. It's a little drop going into water, right? Think of a pond. What happens when I have two trots? Two, two, uh, your eyes are still recovering from the optics like that. It's like you're in the dark and you're looking through like telescopes to measure the slit width, right? And stuff like that. It's, a, it's an interesting lab. I haven't taught 1D, but I subbed for... Dr. Goldman, I want to say last fall, 
when they were doing this, the double slit experiment. And I've done the double slit experiment actually in 2B, so. But like, just, just think about this. This is a wave. This is waves interfering with each other. This is the phenomenon we see. Okay, understand that the experiment that we're describing, you don't see any of this stuff that's in here, right? You don't see any of that stuff. This is what you see, right? This is what you see. Uh, well, this is what you see, right? You don't see what happened in between. We can't see that. This is our model. And going back to what we were discussing, right? This double slit experiment. So they perform this experiment, right? And now they say, well, if I pass light through this type of double slit thing right here, um, and I've got my, my beam of light coming from back here, right? I've got like a flashlight or something. It turns out that when that light shines through here, it has this effect that with a screen over here, you start to get, um, you know, bright spot, dark spot, bright spot, and it kind of just gets weaker over time. And they wanted to describe what was happening right here. Well, these dark spots are basically places where you have a wave that's interfering. You basically have something like this. This is how I think about it. Imagine that I have a pulse traveling on a string, and it's a square pulse. Okay? So this pulse travels in this direction. And then suppose I have a pulse coming in the opposite direction on that same string. Like this. When those two pulses meet each other, they're going to cancel each other out. And they'll kind of pass through. So when, when this pulse adds to this pulse, positive plus negative, you get zero. That's what we call destructive interference, and that's a dark spot. It's really easy to understand the bright and dark spot as understanding that light is a wave. And that's what people thought. As a result of this experiment, everyone was like, oh, looks like Huygens was right. Huygens was right. Light is, in fact, a wave now. Because how on earth are you going to describe this phenomenon here using particles? Right? If they're particles, yeah, if light's a particle, certainly what would happen is this. I've got my slit, right? Okay, and if Newton's right, light is just a bunch of balls that are kind of coming in this direction, right? This is light now. All these balls are traveling this way. Okay, maybe some of them are traveling this way and some of them are traveling that way. I don't know. On average, my light is traveling like this. It hits the partition, right? And I've got my screen over here. So this is a screen. What's going to happen now? Imagine I've got a ball, and it comes in, and it, it gets through here, and it doesn't hit the sides. Well, it's basically just going to keep going in a straight line, and it's going to show up right there. And then the ball's on the other side. Well, maybe some of them are going to bounce off of here, and maybe some of them are going to bounce off of here or here, and they won't get through. But the ones that do get through, they're probably just going to travel on a straight line, like this. Right? Okay, and maybe some of them hit the edge right here, and okay, some of them randomly bounce way over here, and some of them randomly bounce way over here, but why would I understand that as a result of that, I start to get these patterns? It's like a pattern. It's not... So what you would expect if light was a particle is that you basically get a bright spot here and you get a bright spot here. But that's not what happens, right? This is not physically what we observe. This is what we observe. So how do you explain the double slit experiment, the interference phenomenon that occurs right here, unless you just say, well, it must be the case that light's a wave. So in 1820, it was basically, it was confirmed. Like you would, you would, you would consider this to be a confirmation of a theory. Does that make sense? Like we have two competing theories. One of them says light's a particle. One of them says light's a wave. We've got an experiment that we do, and it has this interference effect. And so now there's a new property, right? We, have, we add a new property to our list. Not only can mirror reflect light, different colors, you can have refraction, the speed is constant. We have a new thing. Light can interfere with itself. Um, you said same logic as to why there are places in a movie theater that have the best sound. Yes, that's right. Depending on how they set up their, 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 their um, you know, the theater itself, but yeah. You're gonna have you can have interference of sound waves too. The same thing. So this was confirmation that light was in fact a wave. And for years after that, up until 1899, uh, something like that, 1899, 1895, there was there were no new experiments that occurred that allowed us to think any differently about what light was until what's called the photoelectric effect. All right. So this was basically confirmation that light had to be treated as a wave. A wave that has a constant speed. Um, yeah. And that's light. That's light. You guys have any questions so far?
Any questions at all? Does that make sense to you guys? So, man, what to do next? The, ne the next thing I want to go into is really quite complicated, and I, I, I don't think I can do it quickly enough here. What do I want to say? The next short amount of time here. So these are the properties of light. Yeah, I mean, I think I've discussed everything that we want to discuss here. So the goal now is to is to see kind of like what Maxwell did. To understand how Maxwell basically used his understanding of light, electricity, and magnetism to prove that light is actually related to these ideas here. It's related to this equation and it's related to this equation. Okay? So um how can I how can I frame this for you in a way that makes that's in, that's gonna kind of like set it up properly? So light's a wave, right? There's certain that light's a wave at this point, right? Can you guys tell me what you know about waves? This would be something that if you took one and B you probably uh know something about. Um, you're saying that you would observe this if you actually did something with the light? That's something we can talk about later. Properties. What do you guys know about waves? What What are waves? What are some examples of waves? Like, what is a wave? What's an example of another object, another type of thing that, that is a wave? Sound is one of them, right? Ocean waves, right? Water waves. Like the ripples in a pond or the ocean. Waves on strings, like a guitar. <laughs> G-H. Right, if you pluck a guitar string, it basically vibrates with a certain frequency that produces, a, that produces sound, right? And if you make the string shorter, what happens? If I take a string, right, and I pluck it, and then I cut that string in half and I pluck it again. What's the difference between the sound that you hear? It's a higher pitch, right? When it's shorter, shorter string, it's a higher pitch because shorter string means shorter wavelength and shorter wavelength means higher frequency, right? So if you want a really high pitch sound, you have a short string and you pluck it. If you want a really low pitch sound, you've got a really long string. And if you make the string really thick, it will be even lower, right? Because the string won't vibrate as fast because if it's thick, it's got a lot of inertia, a lot of mass. Um, you think about the way that guitars and bass guitars are designed, right? Like a rhythm guitar, whatever you want to call it, has like really skinny strings, but then a bass guitar has really fat strings, right? And those fat strings give you the lower pitch, right? Sound, water, guitar string, what else? Now we're adding light, basically. What kind of wave is light then? I mean, one of the properties of waves is you need basically two things. One, you need a medium. And two, you need a disturbance. Right? In the case of water waves, the disturbance is dropping a rock in the water or touching the water or something like that. In the case of a guitar string, it's the plucking of the string. That's the disturbance of the medium. The medium is the string. Uh, with sound, the disturbance is me talking, which causes, there's a vibration in the back of my throat that's basically moving something. What's the medium for sound? Air. Yep, two people answered really quickly there. It's air, right? But not only air, I mean, water can be a medium for sound, right? You can talk to people underwater. It sounds really weird and wonky, but you can do it, right? Um, it could propagate through a solid in the sense that, like, if I take a, you know, fork and I bang it on the table, uh, the sound propagates through the fork, right? Uh, you could put your ear down. You see this in old movies, uh, maybe Westerns or something like that. People will, like, put their ear down to the ground and try to hear if they can feel any vibrations from, like... Um, that's a sound wave that propagates through the earth, effectively, if there's, like, some nearby horse that's, like, clumping around or 
there's a train coming in the distance, right? People will like put their ears on the train tracks, right? An earthquake is another example of a wave too, right? It's a type of wave that occurs in the crust of the earth. And the medium in that case is the earth. And the disturbance is the earthquake. The... Right, so you need a medium, you need a disturbance, okay? So, so the question will become, there's two questions you can have. Um, what is the medium? Maybe you've got other questions. You guys tell me if you do. What is the medium for light? And what is the disturbance, right? Of the medium. What is the medium for light and what's the disturbance? So the first question we can answer in the following sense. We go back to what we said before and we said, well, light can propagate through air. It can propagate through water, right? So the medium for light could be any number of things. It could be air. It could be light. <laughs> Not light. Yeah, you said the most important part there, Ethan, which we're going to get to now. It could be air. It could be water. Or, as you just said, light can travel in a vacuum. And I'm going to put a question on that because... I want to come back to this. Well, we'll just talk about it right now. What's in the vacuum? The vacuum of space, I mean. We say vacuum. We mean vacuum of space, right? You know, light travels from the sun to the earth. What's in between? Space, right? Nothing, right? Nothing. I don't know if it's it's really nothing, but to some very real extent, it is nothing, right? Um, there's nothing in between. There's a little bit of, like, you know, there's a little bit of small amount of trace materials um, in the vacuum, but it's, but it's mostly nothing. It's pretty much empty. There's very little stuff out there, right? So how on earth can you propagate light through nothing? How can you do that, right? Imagine trying to talk in space. You wouldn't be able to do. You wouldn't be able to hear people talk in space, right? You'd open your mouth. You try to say something, and there's nothing to vibrate. There's no air for you to breathe. There's no connection between your mouth and someone else's ear. When we're in a classroom, when you're in a classroom, like there's air between my mouth and your ear. And when I talk, the vibration of the air is picked up very carefully by your ear because your ear is really good at sensing small pressure disturbances. And the pressure disturbances are what we refer to as sound. Little pressure variations in the air allow you to hear and interpret what people say. Right now, you're not doing that so much as like, you're basically having an electrical signal that's sent through the internet that you're hearing my voice now, but it's very similar kind of thing. So, um, light can propagate through space, whereas other forms of energy don't seem to be able to propagate through space, right? If I plucked a guitar string in space, you wouldn't hear anything. The guitar string would certainly wave, but the, the sound wouldn't come out, right? Um, but light, light seems to be very different because it can actually propagate through vacuum. vacuum. What about the second half? What is the disturbance? What would the disturbance be? What on earth could it be? When I turn on a flashlight, what is the disturbance? When I turn on uh, my TV, what, what is the disturbance that's propagating through my eyes? It's just a source, some source. But what is that source? What would it be? Some kind of energy? Yep, some kind of energy. What kind of energy? Is it a type of, is it kind of like a kinetic energy? Is it a, you know, magnetic energy, maybe? Maybe an electric energy? We don't know. But do you see why these questions are relevant? I'm asking these questions not expecting you to be able to understand them because I think you need to think like this. It's like someone tells you light's a wave. You're like, but a li I know a wave has a medium and a disturbance, so what's the medium? And you kind of like push it. You're like, what well, could be air or water? It'd be like, oh, what about space? And you're like, space, that's, there's nothing there. It's not really much of a medium, right? How can vacuums not a medium, right? And you say, well, what's the disturbance? It's like, I don't have any idea. I mean, I really don't. Just like, if, if I think about my personal experience with light, I think like, well, I can look at the sun, I can see it's this big shining ball, but I don't know what the disturbance is of the sun that allows that energy to propagate to my eyeballs is, right? How did that energy get to my eyeballs and then do something in my eyeballs to allow me to see the sun? Well, you know, what is the thing you know, that's that's the droplet of water. Like, what's doing... Um, let's go back to this one. What's the thing that's doing this, right? I mean, if, if it's a water wave, it's obvious. I mean, I can go out, 
radiation heat flowing? Okay, maybe. I don't know. What's the thing that's doing this? What's the thing that's basically moving up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down that's doing this right here? Well, for the sun, the fusion of helium releases light. I mean, okay. It releases energy. I agree with that, but... Wouldn't it be magnetic instead of electric because electric needs a medium still? Well, that's the thing, is, uh, maybe not. Maybe not. Um, if you think about these equations that we were discussing today, let's go back to one of them right here. This symbol, okay, it's a constant, right? But what that symbol represents, if you go like look in your book, it'll say that epsilon naught is what we call the permittivity. I really like this name. It's the permittivity, I think it has two Ts. It might not though, of free space. Right? If I'm talking about air, there's another value of epsilon. If I'm talking about plastic, there's another there's another value of epsilon that you use. But I mention this because in free space, you can still produce electric fields as long as you have some charges there. In fact, you can actually, as we will soon learn, you can have an electric field. Nah, not, I'm not going to go that far. So, what is this? What could the disturbance possibly be? What's the sun made out of? What's the sun made out of? Okay, hydrogen. Does the reason why have to do with the speed of light being constant? Maybe, to some extent. The sun's made of gas, right? It's not really gas, though, right? You learn about... Um... So here's the sun shining, right? What's the sun made out of? You guys said it's made out of hydrogen. That's true. Is it, is it actually hydrogen? Is it like H2? What is it? What's the sun made out of? Yeah, it's hydrogen. Right? But what type of hydrogen is it? Is it a hydrogen molecule? Or is it a hydrogen ion? It's an ion. You guys do know this, right? That the sun is composed of hydrogen ions. H plus. What's a hydrogen ion? It's basically a proton, right? It's the core of the the nucleus of hydrogen is just it's a it's a it's a it's a proton. But if I have a hydrogen ion here, I also have electrons, right? Right? Because that's that's what you need to balance things out, right? The sun as a whole is neutral, but it's compo I think it is, but it's composed of hydrogen ions and electrons, right? And the the state of matter inside the sun, what's the state of matter inside the sun? It's very hot. What's things that are really cold? Those are solids, right? You heat a solid up, you get a liquid. You heat a liquid up, you get a gas, right? Like boil water, you get water vapor. If you heat a gas up, you get exactly plasma. The sun is composed of plasma. And plasma is basically a hot ionized, as in turned into a bunch of ions, gas. Ionized gas. That's what you just said, Leah. Exactly. That's right. Ionized gas, which is plasma. So it's quite literally a big ball of energy that is composed of a bunch of little ions that are just basically zipping around all over the place and doing what little tiny particles do. Wasn't there that grape in the microwave experiment? It's a little bit off topic. Um, unless it's about plasma. Is it? Does it produce plasma when you do that? I don't know about that. It makes plasma. Okay, maybe so. Yeah, okay, maybe. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that, though. Um, so it's a solid liquid gas. So it is a plasma and a plasma is quite literally just, you've, you've basically put so much energy into a gas that you've ripped the, the electrons away from the hydrogen atoms. So you basically have a bunch of protons and a bunch of electrons zipping all over the place. Now we know that any one of these, any one of these has an electric field, right? The hydrogen ion alone would have a, an electric field would have an electric field, right, that would basically do like this. It's got these kind of, 
got an electric field, right? And these guys right here have an electric field that points in towards them, right? But then the individual particles themselves, right? Let me do a different one right here, like this one, like let's say, for example. It's like zipping this way, and then it's zipping that way, and it's basically zipping that way, and it's kind of like energetically like moving all over the place, right? It's just zipping around and moving. Well, what's that going to do to the field lines? I will show you with um, something else. Oh, there it was right there. I really like this particular one. Flash player's blocked. Um, okay. Okay. So here's your charged particle, okay? And it's just a positively charged particle. So these lines right here, what they represent is, is electric field lines, right? And as long as the charge stays still, that's what the electric field lines look like, right? Do you guys have some questions? I see people typing. I, sometimes you could just have a something typed in on it. Am I going too fast? So what happens when this object moves? Well, if I move it just a little bit, the wave goes out. The particle will shift. Okay, you just said, Ethan, the particle will shift and it's gonna, and that shift causes the lines to move, right? So if it moves up just a little bit, look at that little wave that comes out in the lines. The fact that the particle has moved just a little bit here means that the electric field lines feel a disturbance, and that disturbance is basically a little pulse that goes out, just like a water wave, right? That's what I love about this, that little tiny pulse, you can see it go out like that. Waves don't have to be consistent, like it doesn't have to wave up and down all the time. It starts to get really, I love the way this looks. Um, so I'm just, I'm just moving it up and down just a little bit. You could have a perpetual wave that kind of comes out like this, sending energy out, right? Or you could just have a little bump, right? You bump it, and then there's a little pulse that goes out. You bump it, and there's a little pulse that goes out. This is like if you take a rope and you just whip it, you know? You take a, a, a hose, a really long hose or something like that, right? You pick one end of the hose and you just like throw it, you pull it up in the air and then pull it down really quickly, and you can basically see exactly this phenomenon of uh, this little pulse that goes out along right? And that pulse is effectively how light energy is carried from the sun to your eyeballs. Well, all light, actually. Is that the motion of these particles in here all zipping around, vibrating, and moving back and forth, they're jiggling in place, right? They're just, they're vibrating with all this energy, right? Like, they're just, that energy gets propagated out into space. And it does so through, well, you know, just like that. And we can put a sinusoidal thing in here, and you can see that it basically just continually sends out information, sends out effectively information and energy about like what the particle's doing. And the way that light gets sent out, well, this is light, basically. This is what we're looking at right here. There's some pieces of this picture that are missing, but the fluctuation of the electric field, the fluctuation of that field is what we call light. The disturbance is the movement of these particles. Exactly, you got it, that's right. That's the disturbance. The disturbance is basically charged particles. Any charged particle. Specifically, though, they have to accelerate. They can't be moving at a constant speed. I think I can show that with this here. Where's the... Oh, here we go. Um, stop... There we go. If the particle is moving in a straight line, there's like no waves, right? It's just a particle moving in a straight line. But, you know, if, <laughs> that's what happens if they stop, by the way, do you see that? So it's moving, it's moving in a straight line, right? And watch what happens if I stop. It's like, it's like, you know, you hit the brakes really hard, but it, you know, it, the information comes out, right? So it's moving in a straight line, and then if you stop it, boom, that's an acceleration. So it sends the pulse out like this. 
This is a very simplistic picture of what's actually happening. And I want to emphasize that these little balls, they're basically jiggling all over the place, doing all kinds of random motions because they're hot. And hot objects, as you will learn if you take Physics 1B, they don't just move in these perfect sinusoidal ways, okay? They don't do that, right? Instead, they basically just, they wiggle all over the place, sometimes going this way and that way and this way and that way, and they, they create all these like weird looking little lines right here. This is very hypnotizing, honestly, seeing how these lines go out. And like, you know, that's, that's what they do. They just, they just jiggle around because that's what hot things do. Like I said, if you take 1B, you know that every single thing in the universe that has any kind of a temperature, it basically just jiggles all over the place like this, right? And that jiggling, is what you see. Like, the electrons and protons inside of the sun, they jiggle all over the place, and your eyeball is somewhere over here, and when, when those electrons that are jiggling are noticed by your eyeball, your eyeball basically is detecting, it's detecting fluctuations in the electric field. So whether you knew it or not, before you ever took the Physics 1C, you were already really good at seeing electric fields, or at least seeing changes in electric fields. I told you long ago that the electric field was this thing that we use in physics to describe the way that an elect that, that, a, that, a, that a particle can affect other particles, right? At the end of the day, electric field was like, suppose that I place a particle right here that's positive. The electric field tells me the direction that that force on the particle is going to be, right? But the electric field is so much more fundamental than that, than that, in the sense that when you have an existing electric field and it's altered in some kind of a way, your eyeballs can actually detect the change, right? Your eyeballs literally see this little pulse in the same way that your ears sense changes in pressure. You don't need to physically understand what pressure is to hear things, right? And you don't need to understand what electric fields and magnetic fields are to see things, right? But nonetheless, our bodies have been whatever evolutionarily adapted to allow us to sense pressures, sense, sense pressure variations in the air so we can hear. And our eyes have been, have been honed so that they can sense small variations in the electric and magnetic field that allows us to see distant stars, that allows us to see our cats and dogs and our family members, and also allows us to observe the universe basically on all types of different wavelengths, right? That's what light is. It's this, it's quite literally this, this change in the electric field, something that goes back all the way to the beginning of the class where we learned about what an electric field was. We talked about these electric field lines. The one lab we actually got to do this semester was, was drawing electric field lines, right? And they feel like this really esoteric thing, I think until you get here, and you realize that what you observe is changes in the field lines. That's what you're seeing, is, is, is these little tiny changes. It's like, it's like, it's like if, if it was sitting still, you wouldn't see anything. You'd never see this particle. It's a tiny little particle, and it's sitting still, so it doesn't emit any energy. But the moment that it jiggles a little bit, and it has to jiggle because it's hot, all of a sudden you see it, and you're like, oh, that's, that's a star. That's a star. It's a bright little distant piece of light that's emitting so much energy that over the vast reaches of space, you can see it. And you're quite literally observing the flickering of a massive number of electrons. You know, all those electrons uh, moving together sends out enough energy from a distant star that you that you see it as a point of light in the night sky. And obviously the same thing goes for the sun, right? It's the jiggling of the little pieces of the sun that propagates energy out. So, so what is the medium for light? Well, the medium for light is a vacuum, but then we said, well, what's in a vacuum? You don't really have anything there. And it turns out that we can basically replace this. And now this is getting kind of loose right here, but I, I, think, it's, I think it's correct. It's not the vacuum that's the that's the, the medium for light. And, and maybe even say air and water is not even the medium for light because it's actually the particles of the thing, but it's actually the electric field. The electric slash magnetic field. That's effectively the medium. It's not really the medium though, right? It's not a medium. It's not a proper medium. Th these things are, it's the fluctuations of it that you see. So in a, in a real way, like, I mean, it basically is the medium. So that's, uh, that's our modern theory of light. And we'll, we'll, we'll try to prove this next time. But it takes, it takes some work, at least some mathematics, to prove that light is, in fact, an electromagnetic wave. But for me, I, I don't know. I like to visualize things. And for me, this is a lot easier to understand. You detect disturbances in the electric field. Do you guys have any questions before we stop right here? I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.